So we move on to our opening plenary for this morning. And two words come to mind. Fake news. I, I don't know if our first speaker, Sammy Ramsey, has heard that. We hear it a lot, fake news. But I think Sammy's going to be talking uh, about news, about beliefs that we've, uh, we've long held belief, uh, believed about Varroa mite. So, Dr. Sammy Ramsey is from the USA. Uh, he has a Bachelor of Science uh, from Cornell University and has just finished a PhD uh, from Maryland University uh, under the noted researcher Dennis Van Engenbroek. His uh, award-winning research on varroa biology has changed, or really turned upside down, I think, the very long-held paradigm of how uh, varroa feeds on and ultimately kills honeybees, and has led to multiple opportunities to travel and share this work. So I invite Sammy to come and give the opening plenary on varroa destructive feeds on bee, bee blood and two other alternative facts. So you are currently staring into the face of evil. This is Varroa Destructor, uh, and I'm sure it needs no introduction for individuals in this room, but I cannot make it through a presentation without the background of slides. So if you were looking for the face, uh, it's right there. That's, that's the face of evil right there. Uh, and this organism is considered to be the agent of primary concern in the decline uh, of honeybee health that we have witnessed worldwide. Now, that is something that we have understood for some time now in the scientific community, but it's been difficult for us to really pin down how this diminutive organism has caused so many different issues. It seems like there's such a variety of different diseases and pathologies all associated with this one organism. Now, it was first found in the United States in 1987. Uh, I can tell you for sure I had nothing to do with it. I was negative two at the time. Um, but it caused quite a panic when it showed up, uh, and there was dramatic concern uh, over this organism. Uh, now, there were two sides of things. When it first got here, there were some individuals who were saying, it's, it's probably not going to be that big a deal. And there are other individuals who were saying, this is the end of apiculture forever, this thing's going to destroy everything. And it seems like the answer landed somewhere in the middle. Within 10 years of the arrival of this organism, all of our uh, wild or unmanaged colonies were gone. We have not seen an issue quite like this one ever in the US. Um, we had, uh, we've had some other organisms introduced before, things like uh, Nosema, and that was a big deal, but it didn't kill off all of our feral bees. We had the, uh, the tracheal mites introduced, which also was a big problem, but our bees survived. But only our managed colonies have been able to survive in the face of this parasite. Now, it came from Southeast Asia. Uh, if you uh, look at the uh, geographic range of this organism, it was discovered in 1904 uh, in Indonesia and uh, for a good 50 years remained only in Southeast Asia after its discovery. Uh, and then some enterprising mite at some point decided, you know what, I want to see the world. And it did. Uh, it developed an uncanny ability. It attached to a bee that was not its original host. Uh, so it attached to Apis mellifera, uh, the, 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 the western honeybee that we have distributed all around the world now. Uh, and that allowed this organism to move all around the world along with it. The problem being, 
with everything that we have seen from this organism, with all of the issues that it has caused for us, one of the fundamental characteristics of this organism and how it relates to its host is something that we actually haven't known uh, for much longer than a year now. What is that parasite right there doing to that bee? We don't know if it's feeding right now, and we don't know what it's feeding on. Uh, now, that could be surprising, considering that every paper, every poster, every publication, every fact sheet that you read about Varroa, within the first two sentences will tell you, Varroa destructor feeds on the blood, or the hemolymph, of its host. But what I found as a, a, a doctoral researcher looking for a project to conduct was that there was never actually a study that showed this. Um, and unfortunately, because of some issues with translation, we have been parroting uh, a sentence for quite some time now that actually didn't have a basis in science. Now, one of the reasons for that I think will be more evident if you look at the spread of this organism around the world because when it first left Southeast Asia, the regions of the world where it first became a, a problem were China and Russia. And as a result of that, the very first studies that were conducted about this organism, uh, about the fundamentals of its biology, are written in Chinese and they're written in Russian. And this is before the days of Google Translate. So a lot of this information has been very difficult for Westerners to access, and as a result of that, we have only read the abstracts of those papers, because the abstracts are the only parts that are translated into English. The rest of the paper, all of the work that was conducted, all of the methods, all of the really intriguing information uh, conducted through that process, all of that has been locked away in another language, and we just have one paragraph that's supposed to convey to us everything that we need to know about a study. So, uh, it shouldn't be too surprising to know that in the late 1960s uh, to early 1970s, a bunch of studies were being conducted in the former Soviet Union about what Varroa does when it attaches to bees. And there was a, uh, a study that looked at the volume of tissue extracted by this parasite. The researcher assumed that because the tissue appeared to be a fluid, uh, the parasite must be feeding on the bee's blood. Uh, that was written up in the abstract, and ever since then, we have been saying that this parasite is feeding on the bee's blood, when all that study showed is how uh, the volume uh, of the meal that the mite is consuming, not the contents of it. So, that's problematic in some ways, but did leave me with a potential PhD project, right? So, you know, bright side. <laughs> but in the US, I'm not sure if it works this way here in New Zealand, but in the US, we have a very frightening system in graduate school. In graduate school, you are not allowed to graduate until you contribute an original contribution to the scientific community, as determined by your community. So no matter how hard you've worked, until you've given something that they feel is uh, a fully original contribution to the scientific community, you do not leave with that degree. As such, we have individuals who remain in graduate school forever. When I first entered the program, uh, there was a, a young woman uh, who had actually been in the program for 11 years. Um, because every time your project doesn't pan out to produce something uh, that's an original contribution, you just have to start over with a new one. So I've been a bit frightened by that idea. Uh, when I entered graduate school, I knew I wanted to make sure that I could finish the five-year program in five years. Uh, and so this project, uh, I tried to figure out before jumping into it head first, what are the expectations that I would have from this parasite if it's actually feeding on the bee's blood? Because if this is not a project that I should be sinking years and years of my time as a graduate student into, then it would be good to know that on the front end so I can cancel and move on to something different. You guys follow me? So I came up with these three expectations here. The first of which, and so all of these should be true if this parasite is feeding on the bee's blood, and if it's not, then I might have a PhD project worth pursuing. The first of those expectations was that, was that the, the mites, their excrement um, and their digestive sh systems should be very similar to the excrement and the digestive systems of other parasites that feed on the blood of their hosts. <coughs> That's actually exactly the opposite of what I found when scrutinizing this parasite. 
Let's start with the poop. I'm sure you hear that a lot these days, right? So let's start with the poop in this presentation. Um, that odd substance that you see attached to the walls of the cells, that is the excrement of Varroa destructor. It is very white, very dry, and very crystalline. Now you'd expect a creature that is feeding on the blood of its host, the blood of bees is more than 70% uh, water, so it is a very watery substance. You'd expect that they would have to excrete a high volume of water in order to balance um, the, the, the liquids in their bodies. But instead we find that their excrement is extremely dry and it's not composed of what we would expect it to be composed of. Um, and this part might come off as a little weird, but let me tell you a story for a second. Come with me into uh, about four years ago when I was jumping into this project. Uh, that excrement is composed of more than 95% guanine. Guanine is a, a purine, uh, and it's it's very strange to find that volume of it uh, because it's something that you typically find uh, in particular sets of meats. And uh, this was interesting to me because when I was thinking of whether I wanted to pursue this project, I remember going home, um, graduate students don't make a lot of money in the U.S., so I was living with my parents. Uh, and my father, he would always ask me about my project and ask me about what kind of work I was doing, but this time around he decided to ask me about something uh, a bit different. Uh, he says to me, uh, Sammy, I got gout. I'm not sure if you know what that whole thing is, but you probably do because you're a doctor, right? And I know that, not a doctor yet. On my way to being a doctor, also a bug doctor. So unless you have an exoskeleton, I am not an expert for this field. But <laughs> this is just how it works when the word doctor gets attached to your name, no matter what kind of doctor, everyone comes to you with their medical issues. So uh, I decided to do what I assume any good doctor would do in this instance. I Googled it and uh, found that gout is actually related to the buildup of purines in your joints because you get so much of them from the breakdown of the food that you're consuming that your body is not able to filter them out. And I thought that, that was pretty strange. So the mites have a huge volume of something in their diet that's breaking down in the purines. And my dad has a huge volume of something in his diet that's breaking down in the purines. So I decided to look and see what is at the top of the list of all the things that you should not be eating if you have gout. Because maybe it's similar to what the mites are eating, and it might move me one step closer to knowing what's going on here. At the top of all of those lists, it was always liver. Liver breaks down uh, per gram into uh, the largest amount of periods that you will find of pretty much anything that can be consumed. So that got me wondering about what the bee's liver is, and whether the mites might actually be eating that. Hmm. Yes, yes, why? Now, a lot of you probably haven't been to a Samuel Ramsey presentation before, so I'll let you in on this. I tend to do it like a good mystery novel, so um, I'm going to sprinkle a few clues here and there, and I'll let you stitch it together. I believe in every single one of you, all right? I think you are going to get to the answer before I do. I believe in you. Okay. So we've got the, the excrement from the mites. And I'm gonna move on from the poop now because you linger in the poop too long and that's what people remember. So let's move on to the digestive system. This is the digestive system of not varroa, but typical organisms that feed on very dilute fluids. So things like blood or plant sap. Uh, this is the digestive system for a hemipteran. So hemipterans are true bugs. So I want you to think bed bugs, uh, aphids, kissing bugs, all of those sorts of insects, the triatomans and, and things of that nature. They have to have a very special digestive system because when you are feeding on something that is primarily water and only has a, a dilute amount of dissolved nutrients in it, you have to be able to process all of the excess water in your diet and get it out of your body so that it does not cause you uh, to deal with uh, an osmoregulatory burden that you cannot manage. So we would expect that if Varroa is feeding on bee blood, which is more than 70% water, that it would have a digestive system similar to this one. And this is an ingenious design in my opinion. A really cool system. Uh, so this is the, uh, the filter chamber system. 
This is the esophagus uh, of the insect. It runs into the insect's body. It touches the rectum as soon as it gets into the body, and it exchanges all of the excess water into the rectum and concentrates all the nutrients that then go through the, the rest of the digestive system. All the water is then immediately excreted. So it's a perfect system if you're feeding on um, something that is really, really dilute. Exhibit A. This is the TC fly. And notice that as it feeds, wait, actually, sorry, that was probably a little bit disturbing for me to just throw up there immediately. Uh, I'm going to show you a video of a TC fly feeding on a human being. Those of you who are of weak constitution may want to shield your eyes from this experience. Five, four, three, two, and one. So I want you to take a look for a moment at the back end of this organism's body. Notice that it has to stop feeding and excrete all of this water from its diet. Now, what do you think would happen if this organism continued feeding at the rate that it was feeding at without excreting the water out of its body? Yeah, I heard the right noise coming from this room. Precisely. You have to have a system like this in place because when you're feeding on a high volume of water, you have to intake a huge volume um, because the nutrients and what it is that you're trying to consume are so dilutely deposited in this that you have to consume a large volume of it, get rid of all the excess water, and then concentrate those nutrients. This is what it looks like when grow is. Notice that this parasite's body is not swelling. Also, further notice. Uh, that there is no fluid depositing on the out, uh, on the back end of this organism's body. Oh, hold on, wait a minute, there we go. Um, so, if you look here, um, this is what Varroa looks like when it feeds. And, okay, I guess we might be out of range at this point. Um, so, as Varroa feeds, you'll notice that, there we go, you'll notice that you can even see the digestive system moving, that, that peristaltic motion. Uh, there is a very thick, white, viscous substance being moved through this digestive system. That's one more clue for you guys, because bee blood is neither white nor is it viscous. So, uh, more clues, more clues. But also notice that it's simply a tube that runs from the front of the mite's body to the back of the mite's body. There is no point at which that tube doubles back around to exchange excess water. So this organism doesn't have the right digestive system, <coughs> neither is it excreting the right stuff for it to be feeding on the bee's blood. Actually, quite the opposite. It seems to be excreting the right stuff for it to be feeding on an organ bead of some sort. Odd. Curious. But still, just suggestive. If I'm going to get to the bottom of exactly what Varroa is feeding on when it attaches itself to bees, I'm going to need more information than just this suggestive work. So I, I wanted to look at another question. Is Varroa closely related to other parasites that feed on very dilute fluids? Is it closely related to other mites that are blood feeders or feed on something very dilute? And so this is called a phylogenetic tree. I know uh, as a researcher, it is a big no-no to ever show anyone uh, this volume of information all in one slide. But I just want to illustrate just how diverse the lineage is for mites. And I want to illustrate a couple of things here. So Varro destructor uh, is somewhere in this long list of organisms that you see here. So let's look at the blood feeders. Uh, the blood feeders are, let's see, nope. It's not going to work now. Great. All right, I will go with the normal version of a presentation remote. There we go. The blood feeders are in this region. So the Argacetix, uh, the Orthonysis uh, mites. Does anybody here raise chickens? Yeah, anybody? Yeah, exactly. These are the mites that feed on the, the blood of chickens, so the feather mites that can make your, your chicken's feathers fall out. So this is where the blood-feeding parasites are in the mite lineage. Now, where do you think Varroa destructor is on this phylogenetic tree? All the way at the bottom. You are correct. It is as far removed as is possible uh, from those blood-feeding organisms. Uh, so the blood feeders are up here. It's all the way down at the bottom of this lineage. It could not be more distantly related uh, from the blood feeding mites and still be uh, one of the mites because that's where the mite lineage starts and the rest of these are other arachnids. Now, of course, inside, uh, let, let's look now at the organisms that it is most closely related to. 
Uh, and I'm sure you've already guessed, obviously, it's the Gamma Cephas, the Macrochelys, the Lasiaceus, and the Cosmolelac lines, of course, of course, obviously. Uh, and please do remember those names, they will be on the exam at the end. Now, these mites are of note because they do something really fascinating. They feed on their hosts, uh, on their prey, through a process called extraoral digestion. So they find an organism that they want to consume, but rather than just running up to it and eating it and getting all of that exoskeleton, all of that undigestible matter, they stick their mouth parts into it, release digestive enzymes for their salivary glands, break down what it is they want to consume into a fluid, and they suck that. Why is that interesting here? Because Varroa destructor has the same structure into its mouth parts and salivary glands as these organisms, and the same structure into its digestive system which is very suggestive that Varroa is feeding in a similar manner. Okay, more clues here. So, the first two of my expectations were not met. Varroa is not feeding the way that we would expect it to be feeding. It does not have the right digestive system. Uh, it does not have the right excrement. And it doesn't have the lineage that we would expect from an organism that is feeding on the bee's blood. However, there was a question there that I wasn't going to be able to answer just by looking at information provided by other researchers. So this is the part where I started having to do my own experiments in this system. Um, the, the mites, where exactly they feed, is incredibly important for us determining what they are feeding on. Because if the mites feed anywhere on their host, the way that a tick or a mosquito can on you, they're probably feeding on a tissue that is ubiquitously distributed inside of that organism. Uh, like blood is inside of your body and like blood is inside of bees. However, if they feed only in one spot, maybe they're feeding on a tissue that's exclusive to just that location. So, I decided to conduct a study to really work that particular idea out. So I went and looked inside of colonies tended by the United States Department of Agriculture and the University of Maryland, uh, and actually grabbed bees that were infested with varroa to see where the parasite was actually uh, feeding on this organism. And what I really wanted to determine was whether there were hot spots on the bee's body where the mites were feeding, or whether they were just distributed pretty much everywhere. So this was our data sheet. Uh, we logged where the mites were on the bee's body, and these were the results of that study. And what really stood out to me immediately was that the bees have such a strong preference for the underside of the bee's abdomen. And when I say a strong preference, it is a very, very strong preference. Um, so more than 90% of the observations, 95.4% uh, of the observations were on the underside of the bee's abdomen. While there were a few that were on the thorax, uh, those mites were only there uh, for something that we call questing behavior. When they're attempting to get off of that host and onto another one, uh, when we remove them and put them in an electron microscope, we put the bees inside an electron microscope, uh, we saw no evidence that the mites were feeding on the thorax. Why is this interesting? Two reasons. One, it's interesting because there's a specific set of tissue in the abdomen the mites would have access to if they're only feeding in that region. And that gives us a clue as to what they're feeding on. But two, this is pretty much the most popular image that comes up on Google Images if you type in Varroa on B. This is pretty much exclusively what you see, but it leads people to believe something that is inaccurate. Varroa are not likely to be found uh, in that region of the bee's body most of the time. The vast majority of the time, the varroa in your colony are on the underside of your bees. They are invisible unless you are going through your colony and flipping your bees over and looking at their stomachs. Why is that a concern? Well, in the U.S., and my hope is that things are not trending in the same direction here, but in the U.S., we have a lot of beekeepers who do nothing to reduce the volume of varroa in their colonies. And originally, my question was, uh, <laughs> originally, my question was, why aren't our beekeepers treating for varroa? When I would talk to other researchers about this, they would tell me, uh, the beekeepers probably aren't treating for varroa because they probably don't know how big of an issue the mites are. But when I would go to different bee clubs, uh, I would hear people constantly hammering the idea, varroa is a huge issue, you've got to treat your mites. 
So we have this loss and management survey we conduct every year. We ask beekeepers, what are you doing about certain problems in your colonies? And when we ask them about Varroa, we ask them whether they treat, whether they don't treat, and then we make up this pie chart and we show the people, oh, look, uh, between 58 and 62% of beekeepers do nothing to reduce Varroa in their colonies. That's concerning. What I wanted to know was why. So I would ask beekeepers, if you're not treating, why not? And the question that, or the response we got the most frequently was, I don't have any grow in my colony. Oh, okay, that's fascinating. Um, very impressed by that. Uh, I would like to come and survey your colonies. <laughs> Uh, and every time we would find Varroa just darting about, like there's plenty of Varroa. So my next question was, how are you monitoring for Varroa in your colonies? And we've actually added these questions to the survey. Uh, and the response that we've seen uh, the most frequently, so we include two responses, a sugar shake or an alcohol wash as monitoring procedures. They usually add a third line, they say other, visual inspection. Okay. All right, um, I'll bite. When you do a visual inspection in your colony, are you flipping your bees over and looking at the other? No, 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 no. I take frames out of the colony, I watch the bees going back and forth, and if I don't see a big red dot on their thorax, I don't treat. That's problematic. And that's problematic because by the time you start seeing this red dot on the bee's thorax, you have a huge problem because more than 95% of your mites are actually on the underside of the bees. They're invisible. Uh, there's two reasons why they climb off onto the thorax. So this is questing behavior. The first reason is because uh, the host that they're feeding on has been so damaged by their feeding processes that they need to find a new host. So that's concerning. By the time you start seeing them, they've created some problems. The second big issue is that they start climbing off this way in mass when the colony itself is falling apart so much for one reason or another, oftentimes because of their efforts, uh, and they need to climb off onto a forager and be ferried to a new colony. If you wait until you start seeing the mites on your bees' thoraces, your colony is probably already dead and just doesn't know it yet. And that is concerning. So I'm going to try to enlist your help here. Some of you may have noticed that the title of my presentation is Varroa Feeds on Hemolymph and Two Other Alternative Facts, so b um, Now, Alternative facts, um, this is a, a term that unfortunately we in America have coined. And uh, much to my chagrin, I'm going to have to explain this a little bit. Uh, an alternative fact is something that came up in our uh, let's say less than civil political discourse over the last few years, uh, it is a term coined by someone who was defending uh, a very high up political operative, I'm really struggling for diplomatic terms to use here, uh, is a term coined by someone who was attempting to defend a very high up uh, political operative, and when faced with the fact that the thing that this individual said was clearly not true, but she had to defend him. She said, well, okay, what you're saying are facts, but he gave us some alternative facts. <coughs> and I hate that this term exists, but it's been said that we exist now in a factual <coughs> society, and so now you get to choose what's true and what's not true. I don't like that. So I need your help disseminating this information for me. An alternative fact is a set of information that is clearly not true, but for some reason or another, people really enjoy still saying it. And so if you want to counter alternative facts, you need to very clearly be able to state what is accurate. So it is an alternative fact that you will usually find Varroa on the worker bee's thorax. That will be our second of the three alternative facts, and if you were following along from the beginning, you might have already guessed that the first one is that the mites are feeding on the bee's blood. It's not actually happening. But I uh, hope I didn't ruin the mystery novel there. Spoiler alert. Uh, so the second alternative fact, if you'll, I don't know, disseminate this on social media, tell all your friends in the bee clubs, that's not where you should expect to find Varroa on your bees. 
This is where you should expect to find Merlot on your bees. So this region of the bee's body, the abdomen, there's, uh, it's made up of a set of plates called sternites and tergites. They make up the bee's abdomen. They allow it to telescope in and out in that uh, motion that allows them to double back around and sting you in the thumb if you've ever grabbed them by the wings. You've done that before? It's uh, pretty remarkable how they can do that. Uh, those plates make up their body in a, a really remarkable way, and the mites have learned to exploit this. So if you look here, the mites have actually embedded themselves between those plates and it's allowed them access to the tissue just below those plates. This is a, an electron micrograph of varroa destructor between the plates of a bee. So this is uh, one sternite, that's the varroa micro middle, that's another sternite. Let's blow that up a bit so that you can see uh, just how far this organism has wedged itself in between. So it has really blurred the line between what is an internal parasite and an external parasite. It's really fascinating in my opinion. Uh, and so all of this left me with a pretty clear conclusion here. There's something going on here, aside from blood feeding, and I have to figure out what it is. Because we've been saying since the early 1970s that Varroa is feeding on the bee's blood, and if it's not, that changes the way that we should think about this parasite. So right when I was about to jump into things and tell people, guys, I think I found something that's really interesting here, uh, a couple of the researchers that we were working with said, well, hold on there, Sammy. Uh, you haven't shown uh, that these mites are actually feeding uh, on something other than the bee's blood. Uh, it's very possible that they're not feeding on adult bees at all. I said, excuse me? They said, well, we have never actually seen any direct evidence of varroa destructor feeding on adult bees. And years and years and years, decades upon decades of negative data should tell us something. It's very possible these mites aren't feeding on adult bees at all. And that would mean the data that you've collected from all these adult bees means nothing. It might just be that the mites really enjoy hanging out in that pocket. Maybe it's warm, maybe it's a nice area of the bee's body where it's difficult for them to be groomed off. And I thought that that was very interesting because I've kept bees alive in the lab, or kept mites alive in the lab on adult bees. Uh, if you leave them in a cup without adult bees, they last for about 24 hours. Uh, at the most, usually they die within 18. Uh, and if you put them in with adult bees, they can survive for weeks upon weeks. So I thought they must be extracting sustenance from these adult bees. But nobody wanted to listen to a brother. Um, now, y'all might have noticed don't quite look like a lot of the other entomologists out there. So sometimes you really gotta carve your way in there. And so uh, I decided to tackle some pretty uh, big questions over the course of this. And one question uh, was, what exactly are Varroa doing with these adult bees? Now, things had gotten so heated with the back and forth that we were having here. They kept saying, you know, they're not, it, it seems very clear that they're not feeding on the adult bees. We would have seen some evidence of that by now. We have scores of pictures of Varroa destructors feeding wounds on bee larvae, but not a single image of their feeding wounds on an adult bee. And I thought, you know what, it's because they're feeding between those two plates. And so any damage that they cause is going to be hidden by that top plate that's hanging over. So what can we do about that? Well, electron microscopy is a really, really, really fun field. Especially because we get to use liquid nitrogen. And I love liquid nitrogen. So it is negative 196 degrees Celsius, so it's pretty cold stuff. It's really, really cool in my opinion, literally. We dipped bees with mites in them into liquid nitrogen and froze them solid, and then extracted the mite from that region of the bee's body. And because everything was frozen in place so quickly, you get to freeze that entire experience in time. And so when we extracted the mite from between the plates of the bee, we got to see something pretty exciting. You guys see anything cool here? Anybody? Yeah, oh, you see a hole. You've got good eyes. It's, it's usually, uh, People can't see the hole until we restore color to this image. And you can see something really fascinating going on here. So two things I'd like to point out on the front end. Any idea what this is right here? There's a second one over on this side. Let's see if I can blow them up and make them a little bit bigger. Um, any guesses? Tur hey, you've seen this presentation before. <laughs> You are correct. Uh, so those are the tarsi, or the foot pads of the mites. 
Uh, when we froze the mind in place, its feet were anchored in so well that when we snapped the entire mind's body off, they remained in place. And lucky for us, because it allowed us to determine exactly what this weird indentation was that we kept seeing in the very soft tissue of the bees. Uh, so if that is the foot pad, then this must be leg one. And if that's the second foot pad, this must be leg two. And right between legs one and legs two, we should be able to find the mouth parts of the mite, but instead we find a very jagged hole. Fascinating. Interesting. Interesting. Now, we wanted to go even farther just to make sure that they were aware that this hole was made by the mouth parts of the mite itself. And so we took the time in the electron microscope to actually measure uh, the shape and size of the mouth parts of the mite and to compare that to the hole. And wouldn't you know it, exact same size. That's definitely a hole caused by the calissary and subcapitula in the mouth parts uh, of this mite species. Uh, we've color coded it here so that you can see what parts of uh, the mouth actually created this hole. And that leads us to a really important point here. We say that Varroa destructor has two life stages, right? It has the reproductive stage and the what? Phoretic stage, correct? Or actually maybe not correct. Because those are the two that we attribute to this organism. However, the term phoretic means something very specific that probably doesn't actually apply to this organism, does it? The word phoretic is related to creatures who use their host as a vehicle and only as a vehicle. They attach to this creature and they use it to move them from point A to point B, but they value that organism so much as a vehicle that they refuse outright to feed on that creature. And we have been saying for decades now that Varroa destructor is phoretic, meaning that during a stage of its life cycle, when it is on adult bees, it suspends its feeding behavior. That's another reason why these researchers told us um, we, we don't think that this organism is feeding uh, on those bees and we think that you're going in the wrong direction with this project. And they actually left uh, our research team uh, to join another set of researchers who are about to release a paper uh, declaring once and for all that Varroa does not feed on adult bees because they are phoretic. Now, this is a great example of a phoretic organism. This is a pseudoscorpion. It's attached to itself to a beetle because this beetle has wings and the pseudoscorpion does not. But I want you to look very closely at how it's chosen to attach itself. These are the mouth parts of the pseudoscorpion right here. And they are nowhere near this beetle. It's attached to itself with one of its claws and it is not going to feed on that beetle because the moment you start feeding on that creature, you create an incentive for your removal. However, if you just want to use it as a bus, it's probably not going to care very much about it. Exhibits A, B, and C. Check out this dragonfly. It has a bunch of water mites on the underside of its body. If all of those creatures started feeding on that dragonfly, they'd probably kill it. But if they just want to use it as a bus, it'll let it stay on. And they'll fly those water mites to another source of water that they can live on. And you might have been wondering what this creature is right here. Uh, so that is actually an American burying beetle, and it is covered in mites. And it doesn't seem to care because none of those mites are feeding. They just hang out on its body and allow that beetle to move them from one location to the other. This is what foracy is. Is Varroa phoretic? Well, I thought I'd made it very clear by showing that the mites were actually piercing through the integument of the bees. They're actually pushing their mouth parts into the bees. I thought it was very clear that they are feeding on our bees. But those researchers uh, came back to us after we showed them those pictures, and I got to say, I was at least a little bit smug. I'm like, y'all left our team, but you're going to be coming back now. Look at this. Look what I got for you. I want you to see this right here. And uh, they said, uh, uh, well, those are some really good images. Uh, but it doesn't show that the mites are actually feeding on the bees. It's very possible they just wedge themselves in there so tightly that their mouth parts just kind of pop through. But you haven't shown feeding. You've just shown that the mouth parts pierce the host. So I had some feelings at the time that I had to get over. Uh, it's possible that I said a few bad words. I'm not proud of it. I'm not proud of it. But then I realized, you know what, these researchers are actually encouraging me to be a better researcher myself. Because if I'm attempting to overturn work that has been based on assumption for decades, I cannot make any assumptions in this process myself. 
And so in order to move forward in the best way possible, I had to get back into the right frame of mind and remember, nope, this is actually good for me as a researcher. So we undertook another set uh, of uh, microscopy, and this is general light microscopy through thin sections of a bee that has a mite feeding on it. And you get to see something really fascinating here. I'm really glad that we did this for two reasons. Uh, one, look very closely here. Uh, let me help you orient. This is one of those plates that I was telling you about earlier. That's a sternite. This is Varroa destructor that was right in between those plates. We had to push it back a little bit in order to get the embedding media in there. And this is the membrane, that very, very, very thin membrane is between all of those plates. It's called the intersegmental membrane. It is incredibly thin, and that is where the mites are actually piercing through the host. But what I really want you to focus on is this gooey stuff back here. Now, does anyone have any idea what this tissue might be? Come on now, I believe in you guys. I hear fatty to do Oh, never. Oh, look at you. All right, all right. Uh, both of you are correct. Uh, so someone said fatty tissue, someone said liver. Uh, this, everyone, is called the fat body. It is the liver of your honeybees, and it is an incredibly important set of tissue that I am going to ensure you get well acquainted with in a little bit of time that I have left in this presentation. Because it seems very clear that there is an interesting association between this parasite and this tissue. Exhibit A. When Varroa destructor is not present between those plates of the bee, this tissue here runs all the way under this membrane and forms a very dense layer right here. However, when Varroa destructor is in between these plates, we find that whole sections of this tissue appear to be missing. And we have found a direct correlation with the amount of time that that mite spends in between the plates of the bees with how much of that tissue is gone. Fascinating. Now, still, we're not sure what's going on here. We're going to look even closer. So this is an even closer image of what you saw before. That is one, uh, one cell of fat body that happened to be left behind. Uh, and it's really helpful that that was there because it helped us determine what this blotch of goo is over here. Uh, I believe the, uh, the technical term that we use in science for this is schmutz. So we kept seeing the schmutz right here uh, inside of the bees, and we were wondering, what is this, this goo? And what we found by comparing this to that one cell that was left behind is that this is actually the internal contents of fat body cells. The mites are somehow, and it means that it's not mechanical, it's not that they're chewing, but somehow they're releasing something into the bees that is breaking down their cells into a goo. They are literally turning our honeybees into cream of honeybee soup, and that is problematic. But the tissue that they're targeting is of great concern to beekeepers because the fat body tissue does a lot of things in your bees. And uh, so, just for a moment here, this image makes it clear to us that we have been using the wrong term for a whole section of Varroa's life cycle. When they're on your adult bees, they are not just sitting there, they're not just waiting for their reproductive cycle to get restarted, they are actively feeding on your adult bees. And you might be thinking, well, that tiny little organism is feeding on a really large set of tissue. It's probably fine, right? Every time this parasite feeds, it releases a very large volume of its saliva into the bee's body. And the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture, has determined that these parasites feed uh, once every 1.4 to 2 hours. And they can remain on adult bees anywhere between 3 and 14 days. So they can very quickly excrete enough saliva into your bee's body to break down the entirety of its fat body. And that is deeply concerning. Uh, what was also a great concern is that when we got even closer to the wound, we started to see these sets uh, of bacteria that were present here that are closely related uh, to the Melsococcus bacteria that we know of as European fowl brood. And we keep seeing these uh, parasitic bacteria introduced into these wound sites. And the most disturbing aspect of this is that it appears that the immune system of the bees is doing absolutely nothing to fix that situation. Curious indeed. Don't worry, we'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, but I promised you three alternative facts. 
and Sammy likes to tell the truth. So the third of the alternative, uh, alternative facts today is that Varroa has a phoretic phase. They do not. Uh, and we're going to need to update uh, some of our literature uh, around this, and thankfully we have already started. Um, Varroa feeds on bees during both stages of its life cycle. So it feeds when it's below the capping on the larvae, it feeds when it is not below the capping when it is on your adult bees, uh, and it can cause substantial damage during both sets of these phases. And this particular image is one that we were very proud of uh, over the course of this process because uh, we were uh, actually able to show something really cool here. Um, so this is a cross-section uh, using uh, electron microscopy. Um, and you know what? One of the things that's the most fascinating about it is that you can look at this tissue, this cross-section of tissue in your bees. So this is the inside of Varroa destructor. This is the inside of the honeybee here. And all of that glue that you see there is fat fiber tissue. And what's fascinating is that on the inside of the mite, inside of this digestive system, you see a tissue that seems to be of very similar consistency. Hmm. Fascinating. Very interesting. More clues for you there. And uh, normally that picture gets more oohs and ahs when I unveil it, so uh, I'm a little bit disappointed in this crowd, but it's all right. It's okay. It's all right. It's fine. It's fine. Uh, so that is what the fat body tissue... Oh, I'm going to have to speed up before we get to questions. All right. That is what the fat body tissue looks like inside of honeybee when it's been dissected. You can cut down the side of your bees, uh, remove the digestive system, and all of that glue that you see on the inside of this body, all of that is fat body tissue. It is the largest continuous organ inside the bee's body, and they need plenty of it for plenty of reasons. So my question was, is this what the mites are actually at? Is this the tissue that the mites are consuming? Well, in order to figure this out, I decided to employ a set of methods that every researcher since the beginning of time has always wanted to use. I got to solve a problem in science using glowing fluids. Because that's what we do. We love this kind of stuff. Uh, if you ever look at like, those little clip art pictures of scientists, there's always a guy holding two glowing tubes. I got to be that guy. Except way brown. Um, and so, uh, the, uh, the two sets of fluids are really fascinating. The yellow one uh, is called urine and O, uh, and it is really helpful to use in these circumstances because it is fat-phobic. Uh, so it is a, a lipophobic uh, uh, biostain, and it will remain suspended in a fluid. Um, so it will remain suspended in a fluid that is primarily water. And so that was used to stain the bee's blood. And then we used Nile Red to actually stain the fat body of the bees. Nile Red has the exact opposite set of biochemical properties. Uh, it will attach to fats, it will embed itself into those fats, and uh, it is wonderful because if it is ever dislodged for any reason, it ends up in an aqueous substance in something that's primarily water. It stops glowing altogether. So this is what your bees look like if you were to feed them both of these substances. That is the abdomen of a honeybee lights out, that's been fed urine and O. There's a lot of blood in this body, so it's kind of obscuring some of the glowing from the fat body. But if you look closely, you can see that red tinge there. That's fat body tissue, uh, and that is what a sample of the hemolymph looks like when extracted, and a sample of the fat body tissue. So here's what we're expecting. The idea is that if we feed these biostains to the bee, and then allow the mites to feed on the bee, we can determine, based on the glow coming from the mice digestive system, which of these tissues it consumed. If the mites glow red, we know that they're feeding on the fat body. If the mites glow yellow, we know that they're feeding on the bee's blood. Yeah, right? <laughs> so, at this point, I gotta say, I was pretty proud of myself. I'm like, all right, okay, we got some data here. But then I did it 67 more times because, you know, statistics. Uh, and we were able to say with very, 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 very strong uh, statistical significance that Varroa destructor is consuming a rather high volume of the bee's fat body. Uh, very, very, very little of the fluorescence that's produced here is being produced in the yellow range from the blood of the bees. While there is some blood that is getting into the mite's body, it is mostly fat body that is being consumed. And even when we look closer, at these mites, you can make out the entire shape of the digestive system just in corpuscles of fat body tissue uh, that have been consumed by this mite. 
And I'm going to move a little bit faster because I want to make sure that I get the opportunity to explain to you why this is important. Uh, because this is about the portion of the presentation where people's, uh, people start to ask me, why should we care? If the mites are feeding on the bees' blood, or if they're feeding on the bees' fat body, either way, they're still damaging our bees and we should be deeply concerned, correct? I agree. However, I think that it is actually of substantially greater concern that these organisms are feeding on the bees' fat body than their blood. And let me explain why. The paradigm that we were originally working under was that this organism is pretty much like a tick or a mosquito. Uh, it attaches to the bees, removes a small amount of that bee's blood, and then it moves on with its life. So think about it this way. A mosquito lands on you, sucks out a small amount of your blood, flies away. You're not too concerned about that, right? Now, what if a mosquito landed on you, about this region of your body, liquefied your liver, sucked that out, and then flew away? Would you be a bit more concerned? Yeah. Yeah, I am as well. Nope. Yes. <laughs> I am as well. And here are a few reasons for that. The fat body has nine essential functions that it conducts within the bees, and all of these things are incredibly important to the development of the bees. I'm going to go through a few of them for you, uh, and then I'm going to detail the last part of this experiment, uh, and uh, that will be the end of this presentation for the day. But pay close attention to what the fat body inside of your bees does. Now, you might be thinking, I've never even seen fat body before. If you've been a beekeeper for any amount of time, I can tell you, you are incorrect in that assumption. Because you've seen brood, and your brood, their skin is transparent, and all of that white gooey stuff that you see on the inside of your brood, everyone, that is fat body. Uh, it is incredibly important to your adult bees, and it's incredibly important to your developing bees as well. They are pretty much just a gut surrounded by fat body, and all they do is eat and store energy in that fat body tissue in order to metamorphose into adult bees. Everything that it takes to take that squishy sack that has no legs and no eyes and uh, no ability to move, a very tiny rudimentary brain, no reproductive organs, everything that it takes to transition that organism into a fully functional adult bee is inside of that sack and is going to be reorganized by the fat body tissue. The fat body tissue uh, is actually um, present throughout the bee's body as this disconnected mass, and it actually floats around and helps to restructure all of those broken down pieces of the juvenile bee's body into what it will be as an adult bee. So it's incredibly important for metamorphosis. In addition, uh, it is an endocrine organ that releases the different uh, biochemical constructs and hormones that tell the bee when it is time to transition from being one stage of a larva to the next stage, and from that stage into being a pupa, and from pupa into an adult. It also handles task shifting in bees. We've wondered for quite some time now, why is it that when Varroa feeds on bees, they shift their tasks substantially earlier than they should, or skip whole stages? Uh, instead of uh, doing the, the hive cleaning tasks and um, drawing out wax and all that, they just skip all of that and go straight from being uh, a nurse bee, or sometimes the, the very earliest stages of a nurse bee, straight to being a forager. Now, some of the work that has described this is say we're not sure how the removal of small amounts of the bee's blood would create this specific pathology. But the actual destruction of the tissue that regulates that process, that makes perfect sense. In addition, there's a set of tissue inside the bee's body that regulates its metabolism. Honeybees are not the most aerodynamically designed organisms, and so in order for them to take off and fly from flower to flower as frequently as they have to, they need to be able to manage their metabolic activity very, very well. There's a tissue inside of their body that does that, and what tissue do you think that is? Okay, I'm a little bit concerned by uh, just how few people responded to that. I'm starting to think that you guys might be a little bit afraid of me. Now, I want you to know, I'm not sure how well this, this kind of thing gets across, but uh, I don't really do the trick questions thing. Uh, I am uh, I'm the son of a pastor, so this is going to come straight out of Sunday school, but in my presentations, um, it's going to be a lot like Sunday school, where the correct answer to every question is, Jesus! <laughs> it's going to be like that, but with fat guy. All right? Okay? All right. So, there is a tissue that regulates energy inside of the bee's body and allows them to travel from flower to flower with the energy that they need to be able to take off and get back to the colony. What tissue do you think that is? That's what it is. 
say Jesus? Yes. All right. Okay. All right. Um, we're gonna mark both of those answers right. So uh, <laughs> the fat body is incredibly important, and what we found uh, is that bees that have been fed on by varroa oftentimes will have the energy to get to the flowers, but not the energy to make the return trip. Now, the same researchers who described this, uh, we're quick to say that uh, we don't know how the removal of a small amount of the bee's blood would cause this particular pathology. But if we consider that the tissue that regulates metabolic activity is the one that the mites are actually feeding on, this makes perfect sense. And it continues on this way as we go through this process, because uh, the bees have to balance water loss inside of their bodies. And so your honeybees are shiny. They're shiny because there's a coating of wax over their body that keeps water from evaporating out of their bodies. And that coating of wax actually comes from a tissue called the... Precisely. The fat body creates that coating of wax that covers the bees uh, and allows them to continue all of that metabolic activity without having all the water evaporate out of their bodies. What we also know about Varroa is that when Varroa feeds on bees, for some reason, they emerge from, a, uh, from under the cabin with a waxy cuticle that is much thinner than bees that had not been fed on by Varroa. And as a result, water evaporates directly through that waxy cuticle, and those bees die a lot earlier than they would have otherwise from desiccation. Pesticide detoxification is also a product of the fat body. When there's a toxin that gets into the bee's body, they have a number of biochemical processes all regulated by the fat body that allow them to absorb that potentially toxic chemical into specially designed fat body cells that coat it in an oil that keeps it from reaching their neurons and other things that those pesticides would normally impact. When mites have fed on bees, they are substantially more susceptible to pesticides than they would be otherwise. We have been having arguments back and forth about whether the pesticides are killing the bees, and pesticides are killing the bees. However, Varroa destructor uh, is a, an essential link in this chain because what we've been wondering is how come these bees are dying from exposure to pesticides that they've been exposed to for decades and have been fine with? And I think we have found out what the link is there now. Because multiple studies now have shown that the lethal dosage for this pesticide uh, actually drops dramatically in the presence of Varroa destructor. A much smaller dose uh, can kill a bee than would have otherwise. And it seems to be because the tissue that would normally detoxify it has been uh, heavily broken down. Um, so two more slides about this really quickly. Uh, immune function. Immune function is a function of the fat body. Uh, and it is, it is a very complicated process, but the very beginning of it starts with a set of peptides called antimicrobial peptides. They are created by the fat body, and the moment that a microorganism gets into the bee's body that shouldn't be there, uh, these antimicrobial peptides are released from the fat body, and they attack that organism. They also mark it for death so that large cells can come along and destroy that bacteria. If you don't have those antimicrobial peptides, the rest of the immune system doesn't work. And so this also helps us understand why we keep seeing bacteria in the wounds of the bees that are not being impacted by uh, the immune system of the bees themselves. And lastly, vitelligenics. What you're looking at now are the ovaries of the bees, and you might be wondering why I'm showing you bee ovaries when Varroa don't feed on queens. Well, all of those eggs are packed with a set of proteins called vitelligenics, and these are incredibly important because they reduce oxidative stress. So you, you might be wondering how these bees are actually able to survive the lengthy period of time that they're able to survive uh, during the winter. When they're awake the entire time, uh, these same bees that are surviving maybe 45, year, or 45 days uh, during the growing season are able to survive three, four, or five months in some areas. It's because these vitelligenins reduce oxidative stress in their bodies and allow them to live much longer because oxidative stress, stress is the primary thing that makes us age. These vitelligenins are created by the fat body. And so, by the mites impacting the fat body, they are impacting the bee's ability to extend its lifespan through the winter. So it's impacting all of the most important processes of the bees by feeding on this tissue. The last thing that I had to look at in the course of this experiment, I'm gonna have to go through this in two minutes flat. The last thing that I had to look at in the course of this project, I could already hear the reviewers in my mind now saying, what you've shown is that the mites feed on fat body adults, but you haven't done anything uh, 
Is time all, all the way up? No? Okay. Two minutes. Three minutes. Wonderful. No. Gotcha. So, uh, these mice are feeding on fat body, but are they feeding on fat body in the group? Well, in order to do this, I had to conduct uh, a set of feeding assays where I was allowed to feed the mites what I wanted them to consume and see if they were able to still produce eggs the way they would normally be able to when feeding on brood. Uh, this was heavily advised against uh, by my committee and my advisor at the time uh, because people have been trying to feed grow in the lab for decades and no one's been able to get it to work. They haven't been able to get them to survive. They've not been able to get them to consistently produce eggs. And so uh, it was pretty clear that I was going to have a tough time with this, but I decided to take a crack at it anyway. So first I created these cute little mite motels out of compressed beeswax for the mites to live inside of. Uh, they mimic the size of drone cells, so the mites would be very comfortable. And then I had to create decoy pupa for the mites to feed on. Now hopefully you were fooled because one of these things is not like the other. <laughs> One of these things is actually a size 5 gelatin capsule, and the mites were fooled by it. Uh, we would place the mites on the table uh, with uh, that uh, honeybee pupa, honeybee larva, and this gel capsule that's actually been wrapped in parafilm, so it will have the same tactile consistency uh, of honeybee brood. And what we found is that it wasn't until I actually rubbed that parafilm against bees so that it would have the same smell and taste of the bee that the mites were actually fooled by it. Because it's not the appearance of it that's really that important. It's the smell and taste because Varroa are blind. That one took me a while to get, and I'm a little bit embarrassed that it took so long. But rubbing it against the bees was really the, the key to getting the mites to actually feed on it. Uh, we cut a trough into the bottom, uh, filled this entire thing with hemolymph or fat body or some combination of the two, uh, and that is what it looked like uh, for the whole setup. We used cling wrap as a lid so we could see straight through it. And uh, I've got one question for you for which the answer will not be fat body. So just warning here. Does anyone have any guess as to what that object is that was found on the clay wrap? Any guesses there? I'll even blow it up, make it a little bit larger for you. Any questions? I'm just saying that. Nice! Air high five to you. You made that quick for me. Now, normally, it's not until uh, I get a lot closer, but I, guys, I gotta tell you. I lost my mind when I saw this. Like, this was a huge deal. I, I, I had to calm myself down, Sammy. It's four o'clock in the morning. You very well could be delirious. It is not time to celebrate yet. Wait until tomorrow when you can get it into the electron microscope. Then we got it into the electron microscope and got the first, uh, so this is the first time people have been able to get Varroa destructor to actually reproduce in the lab uh, and produce eggs. And guys, I was so excited to see this thing. I even named it. It's adorable. I was so proud of her. Her name is PhD. Uh, <laughs> Come on, y'all. Y'all know at this point, they're going to give a brother his PhD. So, uh, what we found is that if you starve Varroa, they do not produce any eggs. Shocking. Shocking. Uh, but if you feed them hemolymph, there is no significant difference in the amount of eggs produced uh, if they're starved or if they're fed the bee's blood. However, if you feed them fat body, and I mean any amount of fat body, 25% fat body uh, to the volume of the meal up to 100% fat body, and they will produce eggs. They produce the most eggs when fed 100% fat body. This is a survivorship curve also showing that they survive the best when fed 100% fat body, and that there is no difference in their survivorship when starved and when fed hemolymph of the bees. Uh, if you want to know more about this discovery, more than I can say in, more than I can say in this presentation, you can check out the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences because they published my thesis research. I was super excited about that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. They uh, told me during the publication process that it is unusual for uh, someone at my age and someone uh, coming out of his, his uh, thesis research to actually have that thesis research published in PNAS. So I was very excited about that. And furthermore, they put that image that I was talking about on the cover. So that was really cool too. Um, the conclusions to this is that these mites are not feeding on the bee's blood, and that changes the way that we think about how this organism uh, actually impacts honeybees. Uh, it also changes the way that we think about how we as beekeepers interface with this parasite. 
There are um, beekeepers who think that it's a good idea to add pollen patties to their colonies uh, in lieu of treating for the mice themselves. The idea is that the pollen will make the bees stronger and then they'll be able to fight off the mites on their own. Not a great idea because the tissue inside the bees that stores all that excess protein is the... And if they don't have enough fat body to store that excess protein, it can actually build up to toxic levels inside of the bee's body. So if you are a non-treatment beekeeper, you've chosen not to treat for whatever reason, uh, it, it is not helping at all for you to then put pollen patties into the colonies while you have a colony that is above threshold. You might actually be doing damage to your bees in that way. Uh, and lastly, there are uh, a couple of companies now that are attempting to use these filings to create uh, a new set of pesticides that can be used against the mites. Uh, more information will be available about that later, but I have signed some non-disclosure agreements, so I can't tell you about it right now. Thank you very much for listening to the lengthy presentation. I'm not sure if we have time for questions, but I would love to take them if possible. Thank you. Thanks, Sammy. Sorry, we won't have time for questions.